Chapter 5 Firmware In this chapter you will learn how to define and explain the function of firmware UEFI, BIOS, CMOS, ROM. Distinguish among various system setup utility options, troubleshoot using the power on self-test or post, and maintain BIOS slash UEFI settings. In Chapter 3 you saw how the address bus and a data bus connect RAM to the CPU via the memory controller to run programs and transfer data. Assuming you apply power in the right places, you, need any, you don't need anything else to make a simple computer. The only problem with such a simple computer is that it would bore you to death. There's no way to do anything with it. A PC needs devices such as keyboards and mice to provide out input and output devices such as monitors and speakers to communicate the current state of the running programs to you. A computer also needs permanent storage devices such as solid state drives to store programs and data when you turn off the computer. This chapter discusses in detail the software that controls a PC at its core. We'll start with a couple of sections on why and how it all works and then we'll look at hardware and self-testing circuits. The chapter finishes with the finer points of maintaining this essential programming and hardware. We need to talk. For a keyboard or a monitor or a hard drive to work with a CPU, they must communicate via some kind of physical connection. More than that, these peripherals, usually, can't connect directly to the CPU. This communication requires a controller, a chip that connects the device to the CPU. Getting the CPU to communicate with a controller starts with a physical interconnection, a communication bus, that means wires, that enables the CPU to send commands to and from devices. To make this connection, let's extend the data bus and the address bus through the motherboard connecting all the computer controllers to the CPU. Early motherboards were covered in controller chips. Figure 5.3 shows a very early motherboard absolutely packed with controller chips, as well as many other chips. Starting around 1990, a chip manufacturer began to combine multiple controller chips into specifically designed chipsets to reduce chip count and to standardize communication between the CPU and devices. Early chipsets such as the Intel 430VX shown in figure 5.4 consisted of two paired chips called the North Bridge and South Bridge. Chipsets were in pairs for many years, roughly from 1990 to around 2010. Today's CPUs have controllers built into the CPU itself, such as the memory and display controllers. With so many chipset functions now built into the CPU, almost all chipsets are now a single chip. Intel's name for this chip is Platform Controller Hub, or PCH. Figure 5.5 shows where the CPU and PCH are located on an Intel motherboard. AMD, and most of the tech industry, still refers to single chips as the chipset, even though it's no longer a set of chips. The chipset extends the data bus to every device on the PC. The CPU uses the data bus to move data to and from all the devices of the PC. Data constantly flows on the data bus among the CPU, chipset, RAM, and other devices on the PC. The concept that the CPU uses the address bus to talk to the devices isn't difficult to fathom, but how does the CPU know what to say to them? How does it know, for example, all the patterns of ones and zeros to place the, in the address bus to tell the hard drive it needs to send a file? Let's look at the interaction between the keyboard and the CPU for insight into this process. Talking to the keyboard Let's step back for a moment and consider a world without chipsets where every device has its own controller. The keyboard provides a great example of how the buses and support programming help the CPU get job done. In the early computers, the keyboard connected to the data bus via a special chip known as the keyboard controller. Don't bother looking for this chip on your motherboard. Chipsets long ago replaced keyboard controller chips. 
even though dedicated keyboard controller chips no longer exist, the way the keyboard controller functions with the CPU has changed only a small amount in the past decades, making it a perfect tool to illustrate how the CPU talks to a device. The keyboard controller was one of the last single function chips to be absorbed into the chipset. Every time you press a key on your keyboard, a scanning chip in the keyboard notices which key you pressed. Then the scanner sends a coded pattern of ones and zeros called the scan code to the keyboard controller. Every key on your keyboard has a unique scan code. The keyboard controller stores the scan code in its own register. Does it surprise you that the lowly keyboard controller has a register similar to a CPU? Lots of chips have registers, not just CPUs. How does the CPU get the scan code out of the keyboard controller? While we're at it, how does the CPU tell the keyboard to type capital letters if caps lock is on, or to turn the NOM lock LED light emitting diode on and off to mention just a few other jobs the keyboard needs to do for your system? The point is that keyboard controller must be able to respond to multiple commands, not just one. The keyboard controller accepts commands exactly as you saw the CPU accept commands in Chapter 3. Remember, when you added 2 to 3 with the 8088, you had to use specific commands from the 8088's codebook to tell the CPU to do the addition and then place the answer on the external data bus. The keyboard controller has its own codebook, much simpler than any CPU's codebook, but conceptually the same. If the CPU wants to know that the key was last pressed on the keyboard, the CPU needs to know the command, or series of commands, that orders the keyboard controller to put the scan code of the letter on the external data bus so the CPU can read it. The CPU doesn't magically or otherwise automatically know how to talk with any controller. It needs some sort of programming, a codebook of commands, ready to go in memory to speak to that particular controller. We call this codebook a device driver. A device driver's code sitting on PC's mass storage that's loaded into memory as your operating system starts. As mentioned above, a device driver is a codebook that contains all the commands necessary to talk to whatever device it was written to support. All operating systems store hundreds of device drivers. The number of device drivers varies wildly. The operating system loads the dr device drivers on boot. Without a correct device driver, your operating system cannot run that specific controller. Want to see your device drivers? In your Windows, you open Device Manager to see all your loaded device drivers. Whoa, wait, we've got a huge problem here. How can your operating system boot up and load device drivers if the system doesn't even know how to talk to the mass storage where the operating system and device drivers are stored? Even if the operating system could somehow magically not need a device driver, how do you tell the system where the operating system is located to load it? What if you like to install multiple operating systems? How does the system know which operating system to start? Forget all about device drivers for a second and consider some of the actions that might be really nice at boot up. Would you like some security, like a password that comes even before the operating system loads? How about anti-malware that stops the virus from acting like your OS at boot time and taking over your computer? Perhaps you'd like to overclock your system. Where do you go to tweak your CPU speed of the CPU or the CPU multiplier? If we want to do actions such as these, then we need some, so so some code to tell the CPU about this. This code isn't the operating system, as all this must be done before the OS even loads. We need to add some code, some device drivers before the device drivers, to make all these actions take place. Not only do we need to create this code, we need to physically place it somewhere on the CPU, can access and run the code before the system boots up. To sum up, we need this code to perform these function, three functions. One, communicate to mass storage and few other controllers on the motherboard. 
Once that function is established, we can control enough hardware to perform the next two items. Two, develop some kind of interface that lets us add to, configure, and change boot time features of our systems, like boot order, security, and much more. We'll need some more of those bas basic device drivers for our monitor, keyboard, and maybe mouse to input those changes and see what we're doing. We might even need network drivers if we want to do cool actions like boot from another host on the network. 3. Tell the CPU where to look for the operating system so the system can boot into that operating system. If there's more than one bootable device, we need to tell the CPU which one to go to first. There are a lot more functions than just those three, but we'll, this will get us started in our learning path. Luckily for us, the code to do all these functions exists on every computer and has been since the first PCs back in the early 1980s. The code exists on your motherboard on a chip. Okay, but what chip technology should the motherboard use? RAM won't work because all the data is erased every time we turn off the computer. We cannot use a hard drive, as that requires a driver. We need some sort of permanent program storage device that does not depend on other peripherals to work. It must plug directly into the address slash system bus so the CPU can talk to it. And we need that storage device to sit on the motherboard. What we need is called ROM, R-O-M. ROM. Motherboards store all the magical bits of code described in the previous section on a special type of device called a read-only memory or ROM chip. A ROM chip stores code exactly like RAM, but with two important differences. First, ROM chips are non-volatile, meaning that the information stored on ROMs isn't erased when the computer is turned off. Second, traditional ROM chips are read-only, meaning that once you store a program on the one, on one, you can't change it unless you go through a specific reprogramming process. There are many types of ROM, but for the past 20 years or so, all motherboards use a type of ROM called Flash ROM. Great, we now have a Flash ROM chip sitting on every motherboard. Now we need to load it with firmware to solve all three functions described in the previous section. Enter something amazing called UEFI. UEFI. Modern systems use firmware programming called Unified Extensible Firmware Interface or UEFI. UEFI is a programming standard that defines how we configure utilities that every system needs device drivers, boot support, and system startup, all on a motherboard's flash ROM chip. UEFI essentially provides the programming that enables the CPU to communicate with other hardware. You've seen UEFI in action during a system's boot, although it's easily missed if you're not paying attention. The correct term for UEFI, device drivers, is services. UEFI provides services to support most of the hardware on your system. These services don't support as many features as true device drivers, but they're good enough to support configuring and booting a system. Note, there's no standardization on how to pronounce UEFI, by the way. Microsoft initializes it as UEFI. Others say UFI or UFI. For job interview, stick with initializing it. You can't go wrong way. BIOS. All current systems use UEFI and have since around 2010. However, before UEFI was invented, these functions were known as BIOS, or Basic Input Output System. BIOS was very ancient, originally designed to be run on the Intel 8088 CPU back in 1981. System makers are very conservative, so BIOS hung on for long after everything else on a typical PC was upgraded and approved. UEFI was complete, completely replaced BIOS, but the term BIOS is still out there and very commonly used. For example, most text configure continue to call the system's UEFI the BIOS. Maybe PC techs are also conservative? Bottom line, be ready to use either word interchangeably. 
Exam tip. The CompTIA A plus 1101 objectives list lists the term bio slash UEFI. So if you see a question that says BIOS, think UEFI. CMOS on a system startup utility. Flash ROM is read only, but there's a problem. Every UEFI needs a tiny bit of writable memory. UEFI knows you have RAM, but how much RAM does UEFI need? You want to add a boot up password, so where do you tell UEFI to store that password? This writable memory is a tiny bit of specialized RAM hooked up to a small battery to keep it working when the PC is off and unplugged. We call this memory complementary metal oxide semiconductor, or CMOS. Today the CMOS is built into the chipset, but back in the old days CMOS was a dedicated chip. If the data stored in CMOS about a piece of hardware or about its fancier features is different from the specs on the actual hardware, the computer cannot access that piece of hardware or use its fancier features. It is crucial that this information be correct. If you change any of the previously mentioned hardware, you must update CMOS to reflect those changes. You need to know before, therefore, how to change the data in CMOS. Every UEFI comes with a system setup utility that enables you to access and modify CMOS data. On a completely new system, with no operating system installed, you'll see something like the system setup utility shown in Figure 515. After the OS is installed, these screens effectively disappear. I'll show you how to access them in a little bit. Touring the System Setup Utility Every BIOS slash UEFI Maker System Setup Utility looks a little different. Some are graphical like the, like the one shown in Figure 515 and some are more textual. But don't let that confuse you. They all basically are the they all contain basically the same settings. You just have to be comfortable poking around the different interfaces. To avoid doing something foolish, do not save anything unless you are sure that you have it set correctly. Accessing System Setup You access the System Setup utility by pressing one or more utility-specific keys when the system is booting, turning off your system and turning it on again. Watch the screen closely. On some systems, you'll read text on the screen telling you on what keys to press, as shown on figure 516. Most boot screens do not show up like that figure. There's no standard key to press here, <clears throat> but the common keys are delete and F2. When in doubt, just do a web search for the right key for your system. Don't be afraid to experiment, there's no danger in trying combinations until something works. If you press a key and the system boots into to an operating system, then either you're too slow or pressing the wrong key. No worries, just reboot the system and try again. Let's start by touring a graphical system setup. Figure 518 shows a typical, simple graphical setup screen. This particular screen setup utility has two modes, easy and advanced. Not all system setups often offer this easy slash advanced option thing, but it's nice when they do. Check the option to go into advanced mode and you'll get a much more versatile utility for changing the interface configuration. The main tab offers some BIOS component information such as the amount of RAM and the speed of CPU plus a couple of options to modify the language, date and time. The main tab not all system setup have a main tab options, but many do. Enables you to configure passwords by setting an administrator or user password. The default for the pictured UEFI BIOS is access level colon administrator. Click the security option to change access information. UEFI setup screens differ somewhat, but you'll find similar options in all of them. The administrator password locks or unlocks access to the system setup utility. A user password locks or unlocks the computer booting to an operating system. Set a BIOS slash UEFI password when you encounter a scenario like installing computers, kiosks at a convention or installing systems in a public library. 
A BIOS slash UEFI password is required to log into a computer's BIOS slash UEFI to stop casual miscreants from messing with your accessible systems. Things get far more interesting in other tabs. Selecting the AI Tweaker tab, for example, enables you to delve into the dark arts of overclocking both the CPU and RAM. You can change the clock multiplier, clock speeds, voltages, and more. This is a great place to try a few to try fry, to go to try a to go to fry a new P CPU. The advanced tab gives you component information about CPUs, hard drives, and optical drives, and all the built-in components such as USB ports. In this tab, as you drill down to each subcategory, you can configure drive settings, enable and disable devices, and more. The Boot tab enables you to adjust boot settings. You can select devices to boot by priority, setting the boot sequence used by the motherboard. You can determine how the system will react or inform if booting fails and more. The Tool tab has a couple of very important features. The Asus Easy Flash 3 utility enables you to update the motherboard's firmware. See the flashing the ROM section later in this chapter for more details. The Tool tab also shows the RAM information. That's the SPD option for Serials Presence Detect you should recognize from Chapter 4. So you don't start thinking that all system setups look the same, let's switch to a UEFI motherboard on the Intel-based portable computer with a more text-based interface. This isn't nearly as pretty as the first system setup, but it still does the job. As we go through the screens, pay attention to the options listed on the screen. I'll call out the features that the graphical AMD-based UFI doesn't have. The Information tab, see Figure 524, offers straightforward information about the CPU and RAM amount and cryptic information about the hard drive. Other tabs do more. Configuration tab shows a number of built-in devices that you configure or enable slash disable here. Because this is a laptop, it has an option to turn on off wireless network capabilities. There are two interesting options here that are covered in detail in other chapters, but warrant a brief discussion here now. The Intel Virtual Technology option enables or disable virtualization support for virtual machines. The Intel Virtual Technology option enables or disable virtualization support for virtual machines. A virtual machine is a powerful type of program that enables you to run a second or third or fourth software-based machine inside your physical PC. It recreates the motherboard, hard drives, RAM, network adapters, and more, and is just as powerful as the real PC. To run these virtual machines, however, you'll need a very powerful PC. You're trying to run multiple PCs at the same time, after all. To support this, CPU manufacturers have added hardware-assisted virtualization. Intel calls its version Intel Virtualization Technology, or Intel VT for short, and AMD calls its version AMD Virtualizations, or AMD-V Technology. This technology helps the virtual machines use your hardware more efficiently and is controlled by BIOS. This feature is disabled by default in BIOS, so if your virtual machine requires hardware-assisted virtualization, you'll need to enable it here. This particular laptop has built-in graphics courtesy of the Intel Core i7 processor. Plus, it has a dedicated add-on video card for gaming. The Graphic Device option, set here to Discrete, means to use the dedicated video card when possible. This uses more electricity than the graphics support using only, one, only the processor, but it makes for way, for way better gaming. The Security tab offers a lot more options for configuring BIOS security than found one, found on the main tab of the AMD-based system. You see the administrator password and user password options. 
but there's also an option to set a couple of different hard drive passwords. The secure boot feature you can see on the security tab is a UEFI protocol that secures the boot process by requiring properly signed software. This includes boot, so boot software and software that supports specific essential components. Secure boot requires the Intel CPU, a UEFI BIOS, and an operating system designed for it, such as Windows. See the secure boot section later in this chapter for more details. Noteworthy BIOS slash UEFI security settings. Motherboard manufacturers, BIOS UEFI writers and programmers have implemented all kinds of security features over the years. This section mentions a couple you might run into on various motherboards or on certain exam in your near future. Boot options. Imagine a desktop computer with two hard drives. How does your computer know which hard drive to access to boot the system? Imagine you're a tech and in order to work on the system with malware, you need to boot the system from a special thumb drive loaded with anti-malware. You need a way to select what device you wish to boot from and the system setup enables you to do exactly that. On this particular system setup, there's a boot tab, see figure 527, that enables you to set boot options to determine which bootable device gets priority. This tab is where you provide support for booting to a USB device as well. It looks a little different from the graphical example presented earlier. See the boot process later in this chapter for more explanation. USB permissions. Allowing your system to boot to a USB drive is a bit of a problem. What if bad guy managed to insert a bootable USB drive into your unattended computer? Well, the bad guy could copy then, then copy the drive, maybe join your network and copy other drives, add malware, and so forth. Therefore, it's important to consider the risk of leaving all your USB ports enabled. In high security environments such as law enforcement, turning off USB ports is common practice. Fan considerations. Today's computers, especially desktop systems, have substantial cooling needs, and they means that means fans and lots of fans. Fans are wonderful tools for keeping your system cool, but they come with challenges. First, fans get louder and faster they spin. So it's nice to make sure your fan spit in slowly as possible. Second, if a fan dies, your system will overheat, causing rebooting and some cause permanent damage. Every desktop system setup, and many laptops as well, come with a fan settings to deal with exactly these issues. Figure 529 shows an example of fan setting in a system setup utility. Trusted plan Platform Module the trusted, the trusted Platform Module, or TPM, acts as a secure crypto processor, which is to say that it is hardware platform for, for the acceleration of cryptographic functions and the secure storage of associated information. Just think of the TPM as a storage place for very secure keys used by all kinds of software on your system. This specification for the TPM is published by the Trusted Computing Group, an organization whose corporate members include Intel, Microsoft, AMD, IBM, Lenovo, Dell, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and many others. The TPM can be a small circuit board plugged into the motherboard or hardware security module, or it can be built directly into the chipset. The system setup utility usually contains settings that can turn the TPM on and off and disable or disable it. TPMs can be used in a wide array of cryptographic operations, but one of the most common uses of TPM is hard disk encryption. For example, the BitLocker drive encryption feature of Microsoft Windows requires TPM if you want to encrypt entire disk drives or SSDs which will be discussed in further detail in Chapter 11. Other possible uses of TPM include Digital Rights Management, or DRM, Network Access Control, Application Execution Control, and Password Protection. Secure Boot 
We live in a world where malware can exist just about everywhere. There are pretty good anti-malware solutions once the operating system has started, but your system traditionally has no anti-malware support during the boot process. The PC industry saw this problem and developed a security standard called Secure Boot to respond to the security of the boot up area. Secure Boot's goal is to make sure that the device only loads firmware software trusted by the original equipment manufacturer or OEM. The secret to getting your system to trust a piece of firmware or software is to first sign the code using a digital signature. We'll cover digital signatures in later chapters, but for now, imagine the firmware slash software storing a note that says, I am trustworthy, feel free to check my special code that proves it. When your system runs a signature check on each piece of boot software and the UEFI drivers, it also checks the core operating system files as well. If the signatures are valid, the PC passes control to the operating system and the system boots. Exiting and saving BIOS slash UEFI settings. Of course, all system setup utilities provide some method to save changes, discard changes, exit saving changes, or exit discarding changes. Use these options as needed for your situation. Exit discarding changes is particularly nice for those folks who want to poke around the CMO setup utility, but don't want to mess anything up. Use it. The CMO setup utility would meet all the needs of a modern system for BIOS if manufacturers would just stop creating new devices. That's not going to happen, of course, so let's turn now to devices that need to have BIOS loaded from elsewhere. Power on self-test post. BIOS isn't the only program on system ROM. When the computer is turned on or reset, it initiates a special program called the Power On Self Test or POST. The POST program checks out the system every time the computer boots. To perform this check, the POST sends out a command that says to all devices, check yourselves out. All the standard devices on the computer then run their own built-in diagnostic. The POST doesn't specify what they must check. The quality of the diagnostic is up to the people who made that particular device. Let's consider the post for a moment. Suppose some device, let's say it's the keyboard controller chip, runs its diagnostic and determines that it's not working properly. What can post do about it? Only one thing really, tell the human in front of the PC. So how does the computer tell the human? PC convey, PCs convey post information to you in two ways, beep codes and text messages before and during the video test. The beep codes. The computer tests the most basic parts of the computer first, up to and including the video card. In early PCs, you'd hear a series of beeps, called beep codes or post beeps, if anything went wrong. By using beeps before and during the video test, the computer could communicate with you. If a post error occur before a video is available, obviously the error must be manifest itself as beeps because nothing can display on screen. The meaning of the beep code you'd hear varied among different BIOS manufacturers. You could find the beep codes for a specific motherboard on its in motherboard manual. Most modern PCs have only two beep codes, one for bad or missing video, one long beep followed by two or three short beeps, and one for bad or missing RAM, a single beep that repeats indefinitely. Caution, you'll find lots of online documentation about beep codes, but it's usually badly outdated. You'll hear three other beep sequences on most PCs, although they're not officially beep codes. At the end of a successful post, the PC produces one or two short beeps, simply to inform you that all is well. Most, system maker, most systems make a rather strange noise when the RAM is missing or very seriously damaged. Unlike traditional beep code, this code repeats until you shut off the system. Finally, your speaker might make beeps for reasons that aren't post or boot related. One or more common in a series of short beeps after the system's been running for a while. 
That's a PC's alarm telling you that the CPU is approaching its high heat limit. Text errors. After the video has tested OK, any post errors display on the screen as text errors. If you get a text error, the problem is usually, but not always, self-explanatory. Text errors are far more useful than beep codes, because you can simply read at the screen to determine the bad device. Postcards. Beep codes, numeric codes, and text error codes, although helpful, can sometimes be misleading. Worse than that, an operative device can sometimes disrupt the post, forcing the machine into an endless loop. This causes PC to act dead, no beeps, no nothing on a screen. In this case, you need a device called a postcard to monitor a post and identify which piece of hardware is causing trouble. Postcards are simple cards that snap into the expansion slot on your system. A small two-character LED readout on the card indicates which device the post is currently testing. See figure 533. Postcards used to be essential tools for text, but today I use them only when I have a dead PC to determine at which level it's dead. If the postcard shows no readings, I know the problem is before the post and must be related to the power, the CPU, the RAM, or the motherboard. If the board posts, then I know to look at more issues such as the drive, the drives, and so on. The boot process. All PCs need a process to begin their operations. Once you feed the power to the PC, the tight inter interrelation of hardware, firmware, and software enables the PC to start itself, to pull itself up by the bootstraps, or boot itself. When you first power on the PC, the power supply circuitry tests for proper voltage and then sends a signal down a special wire called the power good wire to awaken the CPU. The moment the power good wire wakes it up, every Intel and clone CPU immediately sends a built-in memory address via its address bus. This special address is the same on every Intel and clone CPU from the oldest 8086 to the most recent microprocessor. This address is the first line of the POST program on the system ROM. That's how the system starts the POST. After the POST has finished, there must be a way for the computer to find the programs on the hard drive to start the operating system. What happens next differs between the old BIOS way and the UEFI way. In the older BIOS environment, the POST passes control to the last BIOS function. The bootstrap loader. The bootstrap loader is a little more than a few dozen lines of BIOS code tacked to the end of the POST program. Its job is to find the operating system. The bootstrap loader reads CMOS information to tell you where to look first for an operating system. Your PC system setup utility has an option that you configure to tell the bootstrap loader which devices to check for an operating system and in which order. That's the boot sequence. Almost all storage devices, hard disk drives, solid state drives, optical drives, and USB thumb drives can be configured to boot an operating system by setting aside a specific location called the boot sector. If the device is bootable, its boot sector contains special programming designed to tell the system where to locate the operating system. Any device with a functional operating system is called a bootable disk or a system disk. If the bootstrap loader locates a good boot sector, it passes control to the operating system and removes itself from memory. If it doesn't, it goes to the next device in the boot sequence you set up in the CMOS setup utility. The boot sequence is an important tool for text because you can set it to load in spe special bootable device so you can run utilities to maintain PCs without using the primary operating system. In UEFI systems, the POST hands control of the boot process to the boot manager, which checks the boot configuration and then loads the operating system bootloader directly. There's no need for scanning for a boot sector or any of that. UEFI firmware stores the boot manager and boot configuration. 
Some BIOS include a feature that ena enables a PC to use a Preboot Execution Environment, or PXE. PXE enables you to boot PC without any local storage by retrieving an OS from a server over a network. You'll see more on PXE when we talk about installing Windows in Chapter 11. Care and feeding of BIOS-UEFI BIOS-UEFI and system setup are areas in UPC that you don't go to very often. BIOS-UEFI itself isn't visible, the only real clue you have that it even exists is the post. The system setup utility, on the other hand, is very visible when you start it. Well, system setup utilities today work acceptably well without ever being touched you're an aspiring tech, and all self-respecting tech start up the system setup utility and make changes. That's when the most system setup utility problems take place. This section shows you how to navigate a system setup utility and change settings. Keep in mind that you should make only as many changes at one time as you can remember. Document the original setting and the changes on a piece of paper or take a photo so that you can restore the original settings if necessary. Don't make changes unless you know what they mean. It's easy to screw up a computer fairly seriously by playing with CMO settings if you don't understand. Default Optimize Settings Every system setup utility has a couple of reset options commonly called called Load Default Settings and OS Optimized Defaults. These options keep you from having to memorize all of those weird settings you'll never touch. Default or fail-safe sets everything to very simple settings. You might occasionally use the setting when very low-level problems such as freeze-ups occur and you've checked more obvious areas first. Optimize sets the system to the best possible speed slash stability for the system. You would use this option after you've tampered with the system setup too much and need to put it back like it was. Clearing CMOS You read about the process you read about the process of clearing system settings back in chapter three, but the process is worth repeating here. When you mess up a setting by overclocking too much or disabling something you should have remained enabled or vice versa, that renders the computer dead, you can reset the CMOS back to factory default and start over. Almost every motherboard has a dedicated set of wires called CLRTC or something similar. See figure 537. Turn off and unplug the computer, then open the case to access the motherboard. Find the CMOS RTC clear wires. Move the shunt, which is the little plastic and metal jumper thing, from wire 1 and 2 to wires 2 and 3. See figure 538. Wait for 10 seconds and then move the shunt back to the default position. Plug in and boot the system. If that doesn't work, or if you get one of the truly odd motherboards without CLRTC jumpers, power down the system and unplug. Pry out the little coin battery described next and wait for several seconds. Reinstall and reboot. Losing CMOS RTC settings. As mentioned before, your CMOS RAM needs a continuous trickle of charge to keep the internal clock running and remember its settings. Motherboards use some type of battery, usually a 3 volt lithium iron coin battery, to give it the CMOS RAM the charge it needs when the computer is turned off. See figure 539. This is called a CMOS battery. Typically use a CR2032 battery. What does your system use? If some mishap suddenly erases the information on the CMOS RAM, the computer might not boot, or you'll get a nasty looking errors at boot. Many PC, any PC will boot to factory default if the CMOS clears. So the changes of not booting are slim, but you'll still get errors at boot. Here are a few examples of errors that point to a lost CMOS information scenario. CMOS configuration mismatch, CMOS date time not set, BIOS time and settings reset, no boot device available, 
CMOS battery stayed low. And here are some of more common reasons for losing CMOS data. Pulling and inserting cards, touching the motherboard, dropping something on the motherboard, dirt on the motherboard, faulty power wires, electrical surges. If you run into any of these scenarios, or if the clock on a Windows resets itself to January 1st every time you reboot the system, the battery on the motherboard is losing its char charge and needs to be replaced. To replace the battery, use a scriber to pry the battery's catch gently back. The battery should pop up for easy removal. Before you install the new battery, double check that it has the same voltage and amperage as the old battery. To retain your CMOS settings while replacing the battery, simply leave your PC unplugged. Simply leave your PC plugged into an AC outlet. The 5 volt soft power on all mod modern motherboards provides enough electricity to keep the CMOS charged and the data secure. Of course, I know you're going to be extremely careful about ESD while prying up the battery from a live system. Flashing the ROM. Flash ROM chips can be reprogrammed to update their contents. With Flash ROM, when you need to update your system BIOS to add support for a new technology, you can simply run a small command line program combined with an updated file and voila, you have a new updated BIOS. This is called firmware update. Different BIOS makers use slightly different process for flashing the BIOS, but in general, you insert a removable disk of some sort, usually USB thumb drive, containing an updated BIOS file and use the updating utility in the system setup. Some motherboard makers provide Windows-based flash ROM update utilities and check the internet for updates and download them for you to install. Most of these utilities also enable you to back up your current BIOS so you can return to if the updated version causes trouble. Without a good backup, you could end up throwing away your motherboard if a flash BIOS update goes wrong, so you should always make one. Finally, a lot of motherboards these days have system setup utilities that can connect directly to the internet and access updates that way. Figure 540 shows one such update utilities. Just a word of caution to complete the BIOS the update section. Don't update your BIOS unless you have some compelling reasons to do so. Some common reasons are supporting larger drive capacities, supporting faster RAM speeds, and security enhancements. As the old saying goes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Note of caution, a failed BIOS slash UEFI update where something goes wrong during the process can brick a computer device. The failure turns a computing device into a brick, useless for anything but a paperweight. Note, while techs usually talk about flashing the BIOS, CompTIA refers this process also as firmware updates.